Om Magna Timirandasya Gyanam Jalakaya Chakshu Pumbhutam Jena Tasmai Shri Kamehena Guru Vedo Chandraya Radhikaya Tadavaya Krishnaya Krishna Bhattaya Tadavattaya Namo Namaha Yam Pravajanta Pratyana Petika Vaipayanu Yes, thank you. To pull the Vedas back, because 
uh, Avatar Buddha and the second Buddha had to push the Vedas out of India. Because of the corruption of it. Yes. So then Sankaracharya established his apparently Maya philosophy on the strength of the scriptures. Tattvam Trasti, that verse, seven verses like that. So the scriptures came back. And, but what was he preaching? What was the name of his philosophy, Sankaracharya? Advaita. Principally, just say Advaita. It gets confusing on the way. I get confused. Advaita. So, Dvaita means two. And Advaita means one. Like Advaita Acharya. It means he was preaching that one essential um, philosophy. But this Advaita Vad is different. It's actually completely Mayavad, or called covered Buddhism. So this was what Sankaracharya did. Now, there's going to be four Sampradayas manifesting after Sankaracharya. Sankaracharya was in 800 AD. Not so long ago. A couple of, two and a half thousand years ago, basically. And then... Yes, AD, after this. Yes, indeed. And this, Sankaracharya course was Lord Shiva, so this philosophy was very, very strong and prominent in India. It still is today. There are so many Sankaracharyas today, this mind of impersonal conception. So then, the plan was to begin to purify this conception. Now, what is this misconception that we are God? This is the basic misconception that the Sampradayas are going to be presenting their philosophies on this teaching alone. To establish the personality of Krishna, separate from the Jiva, so the great Ram Anuja. Anuja means younger brother, which is Lakshman. This is Lakshman manifesting as the Acharya Brahmanuja. So, and he was speaking Vaishishta speciality in the oneness that actually there's a speciality between Krishna and the Jiva but understand just a little bit of background here this is a little bit philosophical but try and catch it it's in Jaiva Dharma in chapter 15 on page 346 you can check it and it's describing what are the similarities between the Jiva and Krishna because the ultimate philosophy presented by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is called Achintya Veda Abeda. Different yet non-different. So what is the non-different aspect between the Jiva and Krishna? Why was there so much philosophical um, treaties needed to establish this difference? So there is a similarity. So what are the similarities? If you meet someone in the street and they actually say, yes, I am God, don't you know? And everyone else is God also. You say, yes, you are. You have the same qualities as God. And you should know what they are. There are eight or nine of them. Nine of them. Eight. Eight qualities. The first is called Gyan Swaru. We have knowledge and Krishna has knowledge. What is the difference? But Krishna has all knowledge. And we have a particle of knowledge. But there's a similarity because we have knowledge. So therefore it's counted as a similarity. And then the second one is called Nata. J N A T A, like Yana Nata, like Nata is pronounced. Nata Swaru. And this means the knower of the knowledge. So we also know some knowledge. A little bit. Something. Huh? 50 qualities. 50 qualities. Yeah, we know something. But Krishna, of course, he knows everything. So again, there's similarity. And then the third one is called Mantri Swaru or Mantra Swaru. It's said differently in different places. 
This means uh, the ability to reflect or contemplate. This is monetary. We reflect and contemplate our navels, whatever. But Krishna is that supreme personality. These are good ammunition to have when you're speaking to Mayavas. What's the difference between the first point and the second? The answer is... Ah, yeah. tricky, tricky, tricky. Yes, I always get it mixed up too. One is um, the ability to have knowledge and one is being in knowledge. Realize knowledge. So we, we have knowledge like on the table and we can actually, you know, realize something of that. There's a difference between the two. Theoretical and practical. No, no. Theoretical and realized, yes. Gyan and Vigyan, basically. Then the fourth one is Mantra. I'm sorry, 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 that's the Walk tree. B H O K T R I. Walk tree slope. Bhaktaranya Gitamasha, this way. It means the enjoyer. I enjoy? Do I enjoy? Something of Jad? Shakti, the dead energy? That ability to enjoy is in man. And it's certainly in the Lord. So we have an enjoying uh, ability, and so does Krishna. So it's the same from that point of view. And then, uh, one is called Ketra Gyan. K S T R A. Ketra Gyan, J N A. Ketra Gyan. This means I can become the knower of my own consciousness, my own field. Ketra means field, yeah. But Krishna is the knower of all fields. So there's a difference. If, if this understanding was appreciated by all the Sampradayas, they wouldn't have had to go through all these different philosophical exchanges, which they actually have extensively. Because we see, we're going to see that these Sampradayas, they actually evolve. There's actually, like Ramanuja is saying, there's a speciality. And Madhavacharya say, no, it's not just a speciality, it's an absolute distinction between the two. And then Vishnu Swami becomes even more, he says, Shud Advaita. It's actually Shud Advaita. We were looking at the names in the month last night. Different books will say different titles for the philosophies, actually. But Shud Advaita is what I've understood it to be during my good day. And this means there's... Um, Purity within the oneness. And then the fourth one, uh, Nimbaditya, is Dvaita Advaita. The uh, distinction of the duality. Which is that's what it's called. Let me carry on. It gets quite intense, the actual philosophies, if we start to spread them out. But these are just the titles of how you can remember. So we've reached. Ketra Gyan, right? That was number five. Was it? Or yes. Five. five. Mm -hmm. So the next one is called um, Paraswaru. Paraswaru means I can give light to others. Like if you're a very joyous person, for example. You can bring everyone else to that same happy, bright, function type of mood. You know what I mean? If somebody can, has clairvoyant vision, they can see the aura, whatever. And then you really inspire someone, they can also become bright. So we have that ability. Influence others by our association. Yes, we can influence others by our association to brighten them up. And darken them also, but brighten them up. It's called Paraswaru. And the next one is called Shuddha Deha. We have a pure body. And Krishna has a pure body. So there's a similarity here. Appreciate why did they have this philosophical exchanges? Because there is a difference. There is a similarity. <coughs> and then the, where are we up to? The next one? The last one is Hichamayi. What does that mean? Yes, we desire. Just desires, basically. Make it simple, just desire. We desire, and Krishna desires. So all these qualities, it's on page 346 of Jaya Dharma in the latest edition, chapter 15, 346. 
This is where you'll find this written one. Okay. We have independence, Svatantra. And Krishna also has independence. So this makes actually nine. So these qualities are present in the Jiva, but the Jiva, because of his illusioned condition, becomes outrageous thinking that actually he's the supreme because he has these minute qualities. So this is the basis of the Mayavada conception. This is why they think they're God. Because they do actually have godly qualities, but they're in very small um, percentage. So Ramanuja Acharya was such a powerful personality. And he took his birth in 1017. A hundred years before Madhavacharya, because it's a gradual approach to this Achintya Veda Abheda Tattva that Mahaprabhu is going to reconcile all these philosophical differences. So, um, uh, he took his birth in a um, quite a humble Brahmin family and um, uh, at an early age there was one Acharya <coughs> of Yamuna Acharya. No, sorry. Backspace. Um, I'm just trying to get an order to how to present it comfortably for you. So, in his schooling, he went to school, and his teacher was called Yadava Prakash. And his teacher was actually a Mayavada. Because this was at the time, because of Sankaracharya, his teachings were still very prominent. So Yadavacharya was teaching one day about the beauty of Krishna's eyes. And there's a word, it's Tapyasan and or Kapyasan. It's written differently, different Kapyasan will say. And he described it as this red coloring, the color of a monkey's backside was the comparison to then show the beauty of Krishna's eyes. That pink color of a monkey's backside. When Ramanuja he heard this, he began to weep piteously that his guru had made such a derogatory comparison to Krishna's lotus eyes. And then he very humbly presented actually the real meaning of this word it's talking about the sun and blossoming. So what blossoms under the sun is a lotus. Actually the comparison given in the scripture to Krishna's eyes was to a lotus, not to the backside of a, a monkey. So but when Yadava Prakash heard this very erudite presentation of uh, Ramanuja, he became very paranoid because he's a Mayavada. A Mayavad is basing his identity on his control of others, like God, envy. So he became shaken by this. He thought, this boy is too powerful. This boy will actually, his intelligence will eclipse mine in the future, so I should kill him. How do I? His guru decided to kill his student. So he made a plan to take all the students to the forest. And he thought, in the forest, I'll get some of the other students just to follow my order and throw Ramanuja down one blind well, kill him. But then Ramanuja's cousin, Govinda, he heard that plot and he told Ramanuja what was afoot. So when they went on that vacation with the guru to the forest, then uh, one night, Ramanuja just gave the excuse he was going to the jungle to pass water, and he never came back. He just ran away. And Ramanuja was running through the forest, and of course, he wasn't familiar with the pathways at all in the forest. It was dark, it was night. But he had great faith and Nishna in the Lord. And as he was going through the various pathways in the forest, he suddenly came to a, a well, and there was a beautiful couple 
standing beside the wine in the dress of a hunter. And he said, oh, I will take you out of the forest. You will be wounded. I will take you back to Kanchipura. So this hunter very kindly guided him with his wife back to Kanchipura. This is described as none other than Shiji. Shiji himself actually um, took him back to Kanchipura. Meanwhile, the um, Yadav Prakash and all the other students, uh, they thought that, oh, Ramanuja must have been eaten by some wild animal. And then they put out amongst them all, oh, he's dead. And then Yadavacharya, he came back very happily to Kanchipuram, thinking that, oh, Ramanuja is dead, he's gone. And to his horror, he saw that actually he wasn't gone, he was alive, he was still there. And he had understood all the plot. So Yadavachari became very embarrassed and shy at that. But Yamuna, uh, Ramanuja's humility was so profound at that time, he could even go back to his guru and carry on his studies. This shows the remarkable nature and tolerance. Yes, and later on, after Ramanuja developed more of his uh, ability to <coughs> Um, address the philosophy, then he convinced Yadava Acharya to become his disciple. Or he spoke so nicely that Yadava Acharya actually became his disciple. This was very beautiful pastime. And then after this, then a disciple from Yamuna Acharya came to Kanchipuram from the south, from Sri Ramana. And he was a very effulgent personality. And Ramanuja, he took Shiksha from this disciple. This disciple's name was Puna, Puna Prakash. And, um, sorry, Puna Acharya. Puna Acharya. And when Ramanuja heard the glories of Yamuna Acharya, he immediately wanted to go and take his shelter. But he couldn't. He was actually bound by various duties in his life in Kanchipuram. But eventually, he managed to separate himself from those duties and go and visit Sri Ranga, where he wanted to have Darshan of Yamuna Acharya. But the very day that he arrived in Sri Ranga, Yamuna Acharya had left this world, he had left his body. And Ramuva, Ramanuja was devastated to hear this, but he requested the disciples, are oh, you please let me see him, I have to see him. They were actually carrying his body on a briar around the different circles of Sri Rama, glorifying Yamuna Acharya. And then when Ramanuja approached the body, um, he noticed that three of his fingers were still tightly bound in his fist. And all the other disciples were looking at this, wondering why has he got these three fingers bound? And then some divine inspiration landed in Ramanuja's heart. And he said very loudly, so all of the disciples could hear, I vow in the name of Yamuna Acharya that I will take sannyas immediately. I will leave my family life and take sannyas. And bang! Immediately one of his fingers opened. And then he said, immediately I will um, write a commentary on the Bhagavatam. <coughs> the um, Bhagavat um, Basya. I will write a clear commentary delineating who is Krishna and who is the Jiva. And straight away another finger opened. And then finally he said, and I vow that I will always prominently serve all the Vaishnavas. This is the particular quality of the Ramanuja sect. So his third finger opened at that time. And of course all the sannyasis and disciples, they were astonished that this, should have, this exchange should have happened. It was practically as if Yamuna Acharya came into the heart of Ramanuja Acharya at this time. At this point, we should consider a little bit the nature of Yamuna Acharya. He was the last of the twelve Alvars. 
and I described yesterday how the Alawites are considered to be great personalities who had the ability to very deeply contemplate the Supreme Lord. This is one description given of them. And they did so much service carrying the current of bhakti through from the time Krishna left. When Yamuna Acharya was a very young boy, he was about nine or ten years old, he was staying with his uh, father, Brahman father, uh, near Sri Rangam, and the king's messenger came in the street and was challenging all the Brahmins <coughs> to come and debate with one great pundit. His name was Kolhala. And this Kolhala, he was defeating all the different Brahmanas. And the forfeit that had to be given, if you were defeated, you had to become his disciple. So he was gathering hundreds and thousands of disciples by defeating them all. And the king was very impressed by his ability to argue, to present the Shastra. He was a complete impersonalist, of course, as they all were in that time. So his father didn't want to become Kolhala's disciple. So he said, no, 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 I'm, I'm not going to come and debate. And then this young boy, Yamuna Acharya, he said, you send a message back to the king, I will come and debate. He's only 10 years old. And uh, this messenger thought, oh, well, this is strange, but still I will deliver the message. So he delivered the message to the king. The king was very astonished to hear that a 10-year-old boy had actually taken up this challenge. So they sent the royal carriage to his house. And this young boy, he went to the royal court. And they're sitting there with hundreds and thousands of disciples of Kolhala. Kolhala, huge man, big pundit in front of the king and queen and ready for a debate and then the um, Kolhala of course he had all his confidence up completely thinking he was just a young boy what the heck is he doing here I can just you know paste him in a minute so then he said oh you make the questions because the nature of the debate was that the one of them would pose a um, well, not, not a question but a um, um, like a question, I'm not sure what the English word for it is. Like a challenge. A challenge, yes, more like a challenge. And then the other would have to refute it. So he threw the challenge opportunity to Ramana, uh, to Yamuna Acharya. So Yamuna Acharya, he said, "All right, first of all, prove that your mother is barren." <laughs> you prove that your mother is barren? You're sitting there, a child goes, how could she possibly be barren? So, call Allah, he just tells you about Barren means not able to give birth. Someone who doesn't give birth. So this was his first challenge, that um, your mother is barren. So Karl Allah thought, this is ridiculous. He said, give me another one. So then Yamuna Acharya, he gave a second one. He said, prove that the king is not the most righteous person. The king is sitting there in front of everybody. Prove that he's not the most righteous person. How could Kohala possibly prove in front of everyone that the king is not the most righteous person? So then Kohala again was totally you know, astonished. And he said, another. And then he gave a third. He said, prove that the queen is not the most chaste lady. This was like really a slap in the face, completely. Here's the queen sitting here, and he has to prove that she's not the most chaste lady. And then Kohala just threw his arms up and said, this is just bogus nonsense. He said, you refute your own challenges. If you think this is actually, you know, for real, you do it yourself. And then Yamuna Acharya stood very simply and very humbly and said, Actually, it's considered in Shastra, if your mother only has one son, it's non different to being barren. This is in Shastra. If you're only able to produce one son, then it's equivalent to being barren. Because Yamuna Acharya, he done his homework. He knew that Kalhal was the only child of his mother. So this was refuted. 
It's a cold heart and he had to conceive of defeat. And then the second one, that the king is not most righteous. And then Yamuna Acharya said, it's stated in scripture that the king takes one quarter or one sixth, a percentage of the impious acts of all the citizens. So how can he be the most righteous? He's accepting one quarter of the reaction of all the citizens in the kingdom. So how is it possible for him to be the most righteous? Do you understand? Because he's taking the position of like God. And in the position of being like God to the people, he also has to accept their sinful reactions. Now the king is supposed to be powerful enough to burn all that up. Nevertheless, he still has to accept them. So in this situation, he's actually not the most righteous. Can you understand? Can you explain it better than that? Well, just like um, in the Bhagavatam, there's a verse that no one should become a father, no one should become a demigod, no one should become a relative. In other words, those who are dependent upon you, like yes. the king, is considered the father of the whole human society under him, his yes. dependents, yes. his subjects. Yeah. So therefore, by the law of karma, he is bound to accept some of their sinful reactions and also some of their pious reactions. And also, just like a parent, a parent is responsible. And, and in that, I forget the Sanskrit exactly, but in, you know, also, what is it? Also, guru. Yeah, guru and associate. So guru guru is also a Right, but guru also gets fifteen percent. Right, guru and anyone who takes anyone who takes from them. So they're they're bound to accept both the sinful <coughs> and pious reactions of those persons who are dependent. And then at the end of that verse, it says, "If you cannot save them from repeated birth and death, then you shouldn't become a superior." Yes, yes. So the king, he's the most responsible. But he takes this impious act uh, reaction. So you understand that answer? So then the third question, how is the queen unchaste? Not the most chaste. And then Yamuna Acharya said, it's described that the king is the embodiment of the eight principal devas. Agni, Vayu, Indra, Chandra, Surya, Varuna, um, what's that, seven? Yamade, uh, Yamuna, uh, Yamaraj. No. I said Chandra. Kuvera. Kuvera is his brother. The treasure of the demigods. So these eight demigods are residing in the king. So how can the queen be the most chaste lady if she's actually living with these other personalities? And this was a resounding defeat called Holland. And he had to concede. And the king became so happy that this very proud pundit was actually defeated. He gave half his kingdom to Jamuna Acharya. And Jamuna Acharya lives his early years in a very opulent situation. And there's a whole other beautiful pastime all about Jamuna Acharya. But our subject is actually Ramanuja. So you can read all this. Is, uh, just, actually, there's a beautiful book by a devotee called Naima Sharanya, and he's written, it's called The Life of Ramanuja. And in this book, all these pastimes are written very in length. There are many, many stories connected with Ramanuja. I'm sure that Srila Bharati Maharaj will describe many stories. But I really wanted to present the essential overview aspect in the sense of the Sampradaya Dara in connection with Ramanuja more than anything. So, I described already yesterday that Mahaprabhu, he took two teachings from this Ramanuja sect. Does anybody remember what they are from yesterday? Service to Vaishnavas. Service to Vaishnavas, yes. And the support of Shuddha Bhakti, pure Bhakti, and Yamilasita Shunya, this pure Bhakti, Maharaj, this is what Ramanuja preached extensively. So, in Ramanuja's life, after these three fingers opened, all the followers and sannyasis proclaimed that he was the next Acharya, because it was such a remarkable occurrence that took place. But Ramanuja said no. 
first of all, I want to spend um, a few months with all of the elder disciples. The mic is not working. Yeah. He wanted to spend a few months or even a few years with the elder sannyasis and disciples before he would accept that mantle of being the acharya of that sect. So um, the sannyasis and disciples, of course, were very pleased with that very humble mood. And then Ramanuja, um, he went and stayed three or four months with all of the seniors, assimilating all of the teachings of Yamuna Acharya so that he could present his basya and he could present these teachings to the world at large. And then Ramanuja, he tr began to travel extensively, teaching this uh, Vaishish Advaita philosophy, that there is a distinction between the Jiva and Krishna. And he came to one city, and in that city there was considered a great guru, and Ramanuja Acharya, he decided he wanted to have the sequence from this guru. He heard actually that this guru had some exceptional mantras. And with these mantras, he could purify hundreds of thousands of people. So Ramanuja, he went to this guru. This guru is called Goshi Purna. And he asked him, begged him, for these precious mantras. And Goshtipurna, he didn't know Ramanuja particularly well. And he said, no, no, you know, I don't give them to anybody. Anyway, they're very, very confidential mantras. I can't give them to anyone. So Ramanuja, he stayed at the ashram of that guru for six or seven months just to build some trust with that guru so he would give him this mantra. And then eventually, after six or seven months, this guru saw the brilliance of Ramanuja. He saw the purity of Ramanuja. And then he decided to bestow upon him this very special, confidential mantra. And he called him in and he said, now I'm going to give you this mantra. But you have to understand, no one else is ever allowed to hear this mantra. If anyone ever hears this mantra, then you will go to hell for that, breaking that confidentiality. So Ramanuja, he very humbly agreed to the conditions that he wouldn't break the mantra. And then, Gosipurna, he gave him the mantra. And in one edition, it's saying the mantra was Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And there are other um, <coughs> suggestions of what that mantra was. But as soon as Ramanuja got that mantra, now this is something of his character and nature, and the effect of the mantra is that everyone would be immediately liberated. They were completely free from their material distress and they would be able to take shelter of Krishna very easily without any impediments. This is the effect of the mantra. So Ramanuja, he left that ashram, he went straight to the village and he climbed on the top of the highest tower and he called all the people from the village and he said, now I'm going to tell you the most wonderful mantra. And then he told them all immediately this wonderful mantra. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Told them all straight away. And Goshti Purna, the guru, he was horrified when he saw this action. He was, he was ready to kill Ramanuja. He was so angry that, what, what is he doing? Is he a madman or what? He's pledged confidentiality and he's got to done this. Now he's going to hell. And then Ramanuja came down from that tower and went straight to the house of Ghostly Purna. And he was begging forgiveness for breaking that confidentiality. And Ghostly Purna was just completely ignoring him totally. And then Ghostly Purna turned to him and said, Now you will go to hell for sure. And Ramanuja said, No problem. If I go to hell, but I've liberated all these people, then I'm not unhappy about that at all. I'm ready to go to hell to liberate all these people. And when Goshi Purna realized the compassionate nature of Ramanuja, when it actually hit him deeply, then he just folded. 
and it's described that after some time he also took initiation from Ramanuja. He melted his arm. So this is a remarkable occurrence actually. These are someone's emotions, etc. Someone's identity practically. He was, this ghostly porter was holding his identity on these confidential mantras and then it all just been opened out by Ramanuja. So this is, a, you know, Ramanuja, Lakshman is very strong, very powerful, fearless completely. So he did like this. And there are many other pastimes, so many pastimes actually, of Ramanuja. But um, I'm sure we'll hear many of these tonight. But my principal point was to um, help us to see the progression of these four sampradayas and who is Ramanuja in connection with the, the, these um, sampradayas and what is his essential teaching and why was it necessary to explain the speciality between the Jiva and Krishna. It's because it was covered by the later part, this one, Sankracharya. So there's a little book that we've just got from, um, to help us on our go, on our uh, Navadvi Parikama. And in the book, on page 36, all of this, what I've just said, is there in very brief form. So you can pass it around and you can see it written in the, like that. And it's just capsulated, basically. You see it in its line. No, the four 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 yeah, that's the idea. Okay, and also yesterday we spoke about those 14 Mandantaras. We were talking about the time frames. So this is a picture of a day of Lord Brahma. Maybe many of you have already seen it. It's been out for a long time. Pass it around. And if you want a copy of this, just tell me. And I'll send it to you straight away. So it gives the separations of the Mandantaras. And the Manus, a Manvantara and a Manu are not the same. A Manu is a person who presides over the Manvantara um, sections, but there are Manvantaras who are avatars within the periods of time of a Manu. Many Manvantaras appear. Lila avatars, Shaktivesh avatar, Guna avatar, uh, yuga avatars, these are all different sorts of avatars. One of the avatars is Manvantara, these Manu avatars, but they're not the same as the person who like Swayam Bhuva Manu. It's different to the Manvantaras within the time frame. Could you explain also the 994 and 1000? So if you do a calculation, mathematical calculation according to this understanding, it's spoken in Bhagavad Gita by Prabhupada and also in Srimad Bhagavatam that there are a thousand ages in the day of Lord Brahma. But if you calculate it 71 times 14, it comes to 996 or 994. So there's a shortfall of six cycles. And it's described that the Sundays the, um, uh, there's a time lapse, just for example, in the month of February. Right, 365 days. Some days a year is shorter than another year. So they're not always the same, like in the month of February, for example, there's a leap year. Yeah, and we have our Rushota month also running on that schedule. So there's some shortfall. So all these shortfalls compressed together make six Divya Yuga, six cycles. So that's why mathematically it doesn't initially appear to be correct, but actually it's completely correct. Okay, does anyone have any question about Ramanuja before I ask you questions about him? He was initiated by Yamuna Acharya, who is the last of the Alvas residing in Sri Rangam. Sri Rangam today is that place of Sri Rangam now. 
and that's the most exalted place of the um, Ramanujas. And the Ramanujas particularly follow very, very strictly. Gurudev describes how Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati supported this Ramanuja sect in so many ways. The etiquette that was afforded to the sannyasis within this sect and also um, the general teachings of behavior between devotees, etc., is essential to build the palace of rasa on top of that respectful behavior. Without that respectful behavior, then if you're trying to build the uh, final conception of rasa, it won't be able to remain on a weak platform of bad behavior, or disrespectful behavior. So in Ramanuja in particular, he had this very, very clearly delineated. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, he takes all of those teachings and he distributes them in his own teachings. Maharaj, quick question. Um, can you relate to what is the Ishtadev and how it relates to that Mahaprabhu took your Bhakti from? Lakshmi Dev is the Ishtadev of Ramanuja. Lakshmi Narayan, yes. So this Lakshmi or wealth is she is having her own sampradaya. She is <coughs> completely Aishwarya. This Aishwarya mood can never leave Lakshmi Dev. When Lakshmi Dev wanted to enter Braj, you know the story. Purnamasi said, Well, can you make Kalgan patties? Can you marry a Gopa? Oh, I cannot do this. I'm a Brahmani. How can I possibly do like this? So then Purnima said, oh, you go back to your austerities in Baalban. So she's still performing austerities in Baalban together today because she can't um, transgress her Brahmani nature, which is her Saiba, her essential nature, in relationship to Lord Narayana. So this mood in the Ramanuja sect is very, very... There's one part in Jaivadharma where um, in the last 14 chapters where um, Vijay and Rajanath are discussing with Gopal Guru very esoteric subject matters and then it's described, Bhakti Nautaku describes a Ramanuja sannyasi came in with a... Um, who was the other person? I think he was a, a Trivandi sannyasi from somewhere. Mayavadi. Mayavadi. Mayavadi sannyasi, yes. And immediately they had to stop their conversation and just make small talk. They couldn't actually embark on esoteric topics with this Ramanuja sect. But that doesn't mean anything about disrespect. It's a Vaishishya, it's a speciality of that sect that we should honor greatly. And we honor their respect for each other as devotees. And we honor their propagation of pure bhakti. Pure bhakti, pure worship to Krishna. But it's not Radhanuga. It's not spontaneous. It's completely understanding. Life. So, an answer to your question, Lakshmi Dev, she fits that totally. She can't change, neither can the Ramana just change. So, this is why Lakshmi Devi is that Ishta Dev. Lord Brahma, for example, is our Adi Guru, but he actually came as Haridas. Yesterday we were at Siddhamakul and when he came as Haridas, he had association of Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Goswami, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu for so much. So he had so much influence of this path of Ragma. So there's availability in our line for that. And then with Vishnu Swami, it's Rudra, then who is none other than Gopishwa, Mahadev. So he also can accommodate that Ragma. This Radha was taught by that Sampradaya, that Krishna Swami Sampradaya. And then Nimbaditya, that's the four Kumaras. But the four Kumaras, that means full of Jnana, full of knowledge actually. But they still um, support and worship Sri Radha and the Gopis. So, I don't know how you get from four Kumaras. They 
have insight from now. From where? From my father. Because the Bhagavatam Mahatmya, Srimad Bhagavatam Mahatmya, is about their speaking about Gokarna, etc., his pastime near Haridwar. So they heard all of Srimad Bhagavatam, of course, and they smelt the fragrance of Krishna's lotus feet, but still <coughs> moved their bow is of a different nation. But today, in actual fact, many of the Nimbadija sect are very rusty. They will talk about all the same topics that we talk about. There's not a lot of difference actually if you speak with them. In Vrindavan, there are many. They have 24 hour kita, very beautiful. And uh, it's not so different. They're worshipping Sri Radha. They're worshipping in the mood of the gopis. There's not a lot of essential difference, even though the Easter days are quite different. What's the priority? Huh? What is the priority? To worship Radha. To worship Radha. To become No. None of these. The other piece is an interesting question, it leads to another point. None of these um, Pradayas actually spoke about Parakya directly. None of them understood the very um, intrinsic reality of Parakya Bhav. That could not ever be given until Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself gave it. So they all had some conception of Swakya. Krishna was married. This is why Radha wasn't with Krishna in the deity form straight after Mahaprabhu left, actually, like in Govinda, in Jaipur. It was just Krishna, remember? And the Vaishnavas wanted to put Radha there. And then the king had to call Baladeva Dibhusha to write his Vasya, so that Radha could be accommodated with Krishna in Jaipur. So it becomes Radha Govinda. You understand this? Understand it? So, but in the lines, it was only Swakya. Even though Jayadeva Goswami and Vityapati had already written about the esoteric pastimes of Radha Krishna, but they didn't have the realization of Parakya. This realization and understanding of what is the nature of Parakya. Because remember for Ramanuja, for example, very Paka South Indian Brahmanas and Vaishnavas, they could never for a moment entertain that God would have relationships with other men's wives. It just simply was not on the map at all. You know, this is why Jiva Goswami, he accommodates so many of those people with his writing sometimes. But this difference between Swakya and Parakya was not uh, understood. Parakya was not ever honored, really. It wasn't wholesalely accepted until Mahaprabhu could demonstrate himself by his own Shakti, by his own potency. This is the tremendous wealth and gift that we have today. They worship, we, uh, they worship Rukmini Dwarkadish. Yes, they worship Rukmini Dwarkadish, they worship Satyavama also they worship. But they worship principally Lakshmi Narayan. Yeah. Ramanujas. That's who they principally. But they will accept Rukmini. But they will never begin to entertain Rana. Well, these twelve Pradayas were there from the beginning. They were always there in seed form, their eternal Sampradayas, but they only became prominent like with Ramanuja. He made that prominent. It has always been there. It's an eternal Sampradaya. And Mahaprabhu, you know, and Mahaprabhu reconciled. He reconciled all the different misconceptions they had about the Jiva and his relationship with Krishna. This is the principal difference that they had all of. There were other ones as well, but this is the principal one. This is the one that they were really having the, you know. This is what their titles are named after. Like by Shishtadvaj, Shudra, Mahan, etc. After that, speciality of the difference between the Jiva and Krishna. I mean, it's very beautiful to consider, but this is the reasons for these Sampradayas. This is why we have, and they actually evolve because Nibhaditya finally is accepting Radha. I mean, Vishnu Swami accepts the moon of Rag, Mark. Madhvacharya didn't, uh, he was, Balagopal was his deity, but this mood of spontaneous attraction wasn't prominent within the Madhvacharya sect. Even today, it's not prominent. 
they still worshipped Lakshmi Narayana, although Mahaprabhu accepted this. Because there is a separate sect today called the Madhavacharya sect, and they're a little bit like the Ramanujas. Sect is Sampradaya, they're still carrying the Dharma, still the same current. But from Mahaprabhu, he gave the stamp of the Brahma, Madhva, Gaudiya Sampradaya. So now it's kind of. But there's still those who don't accept fully Mahaprabhu's teachings within that Sampradaya as well. Followers. That man in Hawaii, what's his name? Okay, these are some facts about the Sampradayas in particular and how is Ramanuja so powerful because he's the first to break this Advaita Vada. You've got to be so, I mean this Maya Vada was so prevalent in the atmosphere from Sampracharya because we see it today still present. So we revere Ramanuja for this great um, gift of purifying this um, Sankaracharya's teachings. Okay, so Ramanujaracharya <coughs> Kita. There are so many more stories and pastimes, etc., about Ramanuja. I think that's sufficient on that one topic today. We only have like 12 minutes to fly in the sky with Trinavata today. So, we'll come back to our topic of the Bhagavatam, 10th Canto, and we're approaching the Rasalila, but we're approaching very carefully and cautiously through these beautiful Bhagya Lila pastimes. We should know that my purpose in teaching this is to give you plenty of ammunition, so to speak, or knowledge, so that when you are teaching, when you yourselves are teaching, then you can start off with these beautiful sweet pastimes and then you can just float over into Vain Geet and Gopi Geet, etc. They will come automatically. But it, it makes like a portal very easy for us to access because there's no confrontations here. Nobody's going to get disturbed if you talk about Trinavrata, if you talk about Shaka Tassura, if you talk about the Gopis too much, there will be certain sections where will blow trumpets and wave flags. So, but Gurudev was fearless. Gave us this, so we must do this. This is our goal. So Trinavrata, he was actually described as a man eater. Eight men. <clears throat> These demons are really powerful personalities. So Trinavrata, and he was sent under the order of Kamsa. So Shakatasura is gone, Putana is gone. These massive demons are gone. And this little boy who sometimes demonstrates this apparent Aishwarya in killing the demons, but the residents of Raj are never remotely affected by that show of Aishwarya. They never think for a minute, oh, our son must be someone special. Not for a second they think of this. They just think, oh, he's been blessed by Lord Narayan. Lord Narayan has come and protected us. This is all they're thinking. This mood we have to have really clearly. You know, because it seems like such Aishwarya acts of killing. But the residents of Braj are not phased one scrap by this apparent Aishwarya exhibition. So, Trinavrata, he um, decides to come and perform his pastimes with him. This particular morning, Krishna had been looking at the birds flying around in the sky. And was thinking, oh, it must be wonderful to be a bird and fly so high in the sky. I can get a bird's eye view of all of Braj. And also, I've heard the Gopas talking about Giriraj Govardhan. I would love to have Dasha of Giriraj Govardhan. If I could fly in the sky, then I could actually see, because he's in Gokul at the moment. Gokul is on the other side of the Jumun River. So, and he's heard about Govardhan, and he has a desire to see Govardhan. Also, he has a desire. There are so many incredibly beautiful ladies in Swagaloka, and they all want to see my absolutely, incomparably beautiful form. So, how can I mix all these desires together and actually fulfill them? Yoga Maya, she understands it, so she allows Trinavrata to enter. And then Mother Yashoda, She's holding baby Krishna on her lap, looking at his beautiful sweet face, smiling. 
and they're having such a sweet exchange together. And then all of a sudden, Krishna becomes very, very heavy. It's described as heavy as a planet. So that's everything in the distance. And then Mother Yashoda, she can't hold Krishna anymore. And she puts him down and she starts to think, perhaps some demonic influence has come into my son. Why should he suddenly be so heavy like this? Krishna knows that Trinavrata is coming. Yoga Maya knows that Trinavrata is coming. Trinavrata wanted to pick up Mother Yashoda also and kill them both. Male or female, he could eat them both. Just being a man, he could eat, eat either. So, um, this was Trinavrata's plan, but Yoga Maya didn't want the, um, Yashoda Maha to go through that difficulty. So, she puts Krishna down and goes into another room to call the Brahmanas to come and perform some yajna to take away this bad influence that's with her son. And then she gets into the other room and she suddenly realizes, oh my God, I've left Krishna all alone, exposed outside in the courtyard. And then she comes rushing back to collect Krishna, but too late. Already, Trinavrata has become like blinding everyone with his dust and all the um, refuse, etc. He's picked up off the ground and he's created this phenomenal whirlwind that's just blanketed everyone's vision in Braj. And he comes in and it, straight away he knows exactly where Krishna is. And he very easily picks up Krishna. Now Krishna changes again from being as heavy as a planet to being as light as a feather. This is all Aishwarya. But none of the Brijbasis are going to be phased by this. And then he picks up baby Krishna. And Krishna's holding on to him, thinking, how wonderful. Now I'm going to see what it's like to be a bird in the sky. Now I'm going to get darshan of Giriraj Govardhan. And now also I can show my beautiful form to the ladies of Swaga. They're all waiting there. And it's described that Trinavrata goes 800,000 miles up in the air. 800,000 miles. That's the description that Kali Kapoor gives in his Vrindavan, Ananda Vrindavan chanting. So Krishna is 800,000 miles up there. And all, he's aware that all the devas of Swaga are appreciating his beauty. And he's smiling very sweetly. He's not afraid at all. And Trinavrata, he's like, starts to wonder a little bit what's actually happening here. And then Krishna starts to become heavier and heavier and heavier. He starts to become like a huge iron ball, it's described. And then Trinavrata, he realizes so heavy, he tries to let him go tries to open his eye, but he can't break Krishna's grip. Krishna's holding his neck as if he's afraid, as if he's clutching onto his neck, holding him as they were going so high. But now he's clutching onto his neck with this tremendous weight of his body. And then Trinavrata, he stops spinning around because the weight is too much for him. And then when he stops, then he starts to tumble. Then he goes faster and faster and faster coming down through the sky and then he crashes on his back and Krishna is just sitting on his chest. So if you think about it, when a weight like that comes down, if you jump up just a little bit before it lands, you've got no impact. Correct? If you're in a lift and it drops and you know when it's going to stop, and if you jump up, I mean this is the law of physics I'm talking about, you jump up a little bit, you don't act, I mean there's a, there's a reason why Krishna's, and a material reason why he's not damaged. He's just fallen so far, 800,000 miles through the sky, onto the chest of Trinavrata, like a slab. And then it's described how all the bridge varsities are wailing and wailing in destitution, that actually, you know, Krishna's been taken away by this ferocious demon. Mother Yashoda, she's wailing and wailing like a sick cow or like a cow that's lost its cow. Completely, totally devastated. And then all the gopis, they, they, she can't find Krishna. She's frantically looking for him and all the dust has been blinding her. And then they realize that this must have been a demon taking Krishna away and their lamentation is so intense. And then they hear this tremendous crash 
outside, just close by, and they run, and then they see the form of this demon lying there. Krishna's just playing on his chest, like completely unharmed. And again, the gopis quickly pick Krishna up and take Krishna and give her back to Mother Yashoda. And Mother Yashoda is so... Um, she revives herself by holding Krishna there. But it's described how this, like, um, mood that perhaps Krishna is going to leave his body, how this intensifies tremendously the love of the Brijvasis for Krishna. They don't take Krishna for granted because they know that Krishna can possibly leave at any moment. Some demon will actually come and steal him. And it's also described that at this time Nanda Baba, he comes in and then he's so thankful to be with Krishna. And at this time Nanda Baba decides Perhaps we should leave Gokul. This is too dangerous. We've had three demons come already in Gokul. We should start to think about leaving. So we know on the other side of the Jamuna there are five forests. There is Mahavan, Lohavan, Mandiravan, Badravan, and Bailvan. These five forests are on the other side of the Jamuna. And then there are twelve principal forests. And then on the other side of the Jamuna, there is um, Talva, Bahulava, Madhuva, Kamudva, Kamiava, Vrindava, and Ka Kokil, no, no, Kadirava. Kokilva is not the main forest. So this forest of Vrindavan stretches from Jamuna and it goes up like in a V all the way to be capped by Govardhan at the top. That's the shape of Vrindavan Forest. So when you're in the Govardhan area, you're in Vrindavan Forest, the part of Vrindavan. So what we'll discuss tomorrow is that beautiful journey that the Vrindavasis make from Gokul to establish themselves in Nandagal and Varshan. So all the um, Brijvasis, they make this wonderful journey across the Jamuna into Vrindavan tomorrow. So this is a very short and brief version of okay, Trinavarta. Can you say more about Trinavarta and the way he has been presented? Yes, in his, in his previous life, he represents false pride by useless scholarship. We should be very conscious of this in these seminars. We're accumulating knowledge in these seminars. But this knowledge must be aimed at bhakti. If it's not to purify our consciousnesses to understand what is my devotion to Krishna, then it's totally useless. Jiva Goswami gives a very beautiful analogy. He says like during a war, the king will hand out weapons to all the citizens. And the citizens will take the weapons and go and defeat the enemy. The enemy is ignorance. This is our enemy. We need to purify it with knowledge. But when the knowledge has been defeated, when the ignorance has been defeated, then the citizens give their weapons back to the king. You don't need the knowledge anymore. It's not something we're looking for retention of knowledge. We're looking for the ability to actually distribute this knowledge in the form of inspiring individuals towards their devotion to Krishna. This is the heart of it. Not to know how much verses you know or how many archives you have in your mind or whatever like this. This is not the object of your knowledge. And it's not our knowledge anyway. It's all actually, this is a descending process. This knowledge is coming from Krishna. You'll find it's a phenomenon. Things you have heard today or other days, you will suddenly remember just at the right time, maybe 20 years later, when you're speaking to someone. And it'll be quite incredible that you suddenly remember this particular piece of information that just fits the need of the time at that particular moment time you're teaching somebody. So this is the phenomena. So useless scholarship. And this gives rise to wrangling debates and arguments. Dry reasoning 
reasoning and logical indulgences in association of people attached to such things. Understand what's happening. When you actually start to accumulate some knowledge, physically your consciousness becomes a little brighter. And you can start to be enamored by your own brightness and brilliance. This is unfortunate. So this Trinada Pisani Chena must be running parallel. This understanding of humility must be always prominent in the Sadhak's consciousness. And this produces controversies which are disloyal to the path of bhakti. Like Mayavad in Buddhism, it's a breeding place of demonic sinful philosophies. This is what Srinavrata represents. This is the Anatta he represents. So Krishna strangles this demon to protect his devotees. So Krishna will strangle this demon with pure knowledge of pure bhakti. What is pure devotion? What, and we can practice pure devotion if I know what is the goal. This is the secret to this. If I know what we talked in the first day about the Sati Paramati Mahi, the goal. Right? The goal is devotion. The goal is not liberation. It's not to become a great jnani or pundit. This is not the it's not the goal to become someone very important in an institution where everyone's ready to offer you respect. This is not the goal of our lives. The goal of our lives is to develop devotion to Guru and Krishna. And Guru will carry us through. This is the purpose, the heart of it. Two seconds. So in the Prabhupada Bhagavad Purana is described that his name is Sahasraksha and he was cursed by Durvasa Muni because he was in front of him naked, enjoying with a thousand wives, and he was cursed to live on the earth for a hundred thousand years, that he would be killed by Krishna, and it's described that Trinavrata was liberated. That was when he came. Okay, there's more details, but we'll go to uh, Nal Nalandriva and Mani Kuvara tomorrow. It will also begin to describe the beautiful pastime of Krishna. Um, leaving Gokul and going to Namada. Brahmanujra Charya Kijaya, Sharija Kijaya, Vaishnava Hindu Kijaya, Gokul and Namada. Someone's got that. Um, Dave, Lord, 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 Lord,